The second type of deed that can actually be given is this thing called a special warranty deed. And the words there would be I, Raymond Modulin, remise, release, alienated, convey. When you see these actual terms, it means a special warranty deed. Now, here's the kicker. A special warranty deed does not have five covenants. It does not have those five warranties that we just talked about. It actually only has two. All right. And those two are we own the property. And while we owned it, we did nothing to encumber it. Notice what it's missing. It's missing quiet enjoyment. It is not telling you, hey, I'm not promising you there couldn't be somebody out there looking for this property. I'm certainly not promising you further assurance. So I'm not going to help you. And I'm definitely not promising it forever. All right, so let's go back. General warranty deed has five covenants. The special warranty deed has two covenants. We own it, and while we owned it, we did nothing to encumber it. Who uses this? The most common grantor or the most common seller are banks, right? When a person buys a bank-owned home, the banks will issue the special warranty deed. Now, understand that the seller is the one that actually determines which protection level they're selling, not the buyer. You can't ask for a general warranty deed. Well, you you could ask for it, (laughs) but the seller is going to say, no, we are only selling a special warranty deed because here's the truth of what's going on. If the bank sells you a property they're out. All right, they're out. So let's go through a hypothetical uh, example. So suppose I sell the property to you in a general warranty deed. You've got the covenant of session, the covenant against encumbrances, the covenant of further assurance, the covenant of warranty forever, and uh all of those that come with a general warranty deed. So now Sears comes knocking at your door. They go, hey, we put a roof on this house last year. We never got paid. You owe us money because you now own the house. So what's going to happen is this. You're going to call me up. And you're going to say, hey, Raymond, you told me there was nobody coming after the property and you were wrong because Sears is knocking on the door. And you promised further assurance. You need to help me because you promised it forever. And I say, yeah, yeah, you're right. That's what I did. So I will help you with this problem. Now, understand, once again, I am making this very simplistic because they would call the title company that wrote the insurance policy. They wouldn't really call me directly, all right? But the insurance company would say, yes, we we made that promise. We allowed Raymond to make those five statements and insure an insurance policy. Now we either got to solve the problem or pay Sears off. That is why a general warranty deed has the most protection. Now, I've told you before, (laughs) let's change the story. Suppose you as the buyer bought this house as a bank owned property from a bank. Sears comes knocking at your door. We put a roof on this house. You're now the owner. You owe us money or we're going to put a lien on it. And you go, well, hold on a minute. I bought it from the bank. So you call the bank and go, hey, dude, Sears is knocking on the door saying we owe them money. 
and the bank is going to say what? Sorry, we did not sell you a general warranty deed. We sold you a special warranty deed. We owned the property, and while we owned it, we didn't do that. And we've told you, because there was no covenant of further assurance, there was no covenant of quiet enjoyment, and there definitely was no covenant of warranty forever, you're on your own. Sorry, we're out. That is what a special warranty deed does. It transfers, boop, voluntarily that deed from one party to the other, but it limits their responsibility to only the time frame in which that person owned it. Banks don't want to get caught up in whatever was happened historically prior to their ownership. They took that house through foreclosure. They don't want to take all the baggage. So when they sell it, they sell it as a special warranty deed. All right. Sometimes you will see trusts use the special warranty deed so that the trust doesn't get caught up in this whole Sears example that I've given you. All right. Now, the other thing that you will see is inherently, by nature, real estate agents are lazy. So when you talk about this thing called a general warranty deed, you will often hear agents just say, warranty deed. Warranty deed means general warranty deed. If they want to talk about this one, they will actually call it a special warranty deed. So don't get tripped up on that on the exam when it says a warranty deed. Because a warranty deed, by definition, it means general. If it's this one, they will say that. So that is the second type of deed. There is a third type of deed called a bargain and sale deed. And it will use the words uh, grants and releases or grants, bargain, and sells. Indiana uses the grants, bargain, and sells in our state. Some uh, other states use this verbiage right here. All right. Now, what the bargain and sale does, does not have <clears throat> even the two guarantees that the special warranty deed has. It contains no warranties at all. None. It mainly implies the ownership. This is typically like a sheriff sale deed. A sheriff sale deed is when the sheriff says, okay, we're selling the property. We're pretty sure we own it because the bank told us to. So you buy a house at the sheriff sale, you're going to get a bargain and sale deed. You no longer have any covenants. There's nothing there. There's an implication that they owned it, but there's no warranties or no guarantees or no covenants at all. So what, what do you start seeing here in these types of deeds? One of the things I want you to notice is the value of the property. So you've got this warranty deed. you got a special warranty deed. Now we have a bargain and sale deed. And as these go downward, there is less and less protection to the buyer. So what does that less and less protection mean to the value of the home? Hopefully you understood that the lower the deed the less value it has. If I am issuing you a house and promising you all of these things, that's going to have the highest value I can get. If I'm going to issue you a home that has a little less protection, that means the buyer 
is taking a little more risk, and that risk translates to what? A lower purchase price. How much lower? I don't know. <clears throat> There's no way. That is the uh, discussion between you and the seller. And if you're getting a bargain and sale deed, it's probably even lower. So as a seller, to get the highest value, I want to use the general warranty deed. But in some cases, banks specifically feel that that offset price does not translate well to make them liable for histor historical stuff. So they choose to sell it special. When I sell my house, and I'm going to use the term mom and pop real estate just on the market, I could choose to sell it as a special warranty deed. I may not get full value, but that's my decision. I may choose to sell it as a bargain and sale deed. I may not get full value, but as the seller, that's my decision. So these are three of the types of deeds that we have. <clears throat> the fourth deed that's out there is this deed called a quick claim deed. All right, let's take a sidebar. Um, talk about a pet peeve. I, I actually have so many pet peeves, I number them. Here's probably number one or number two on the list. The word is quick claim deed. It is not quick claim. Please do not understand, or please understand, if you say quick claim, I'll throw you out of class. <laughs> it is a quit claim deed. Now, it happens quickly, but the name of it is quit claim as in I quit, which basically what it means. On a quit claim deed, the grantor transfers his interest to the property no matter what interest he carries, all right? It transfers only the interest that I have, which may be nothing, all right? So you've got to understand that a quit claim deed has a very special purpose, but is not generally used amongst true mom and pop real estate. Let's pretend I've got a property here in Indianapolis for rent. That's a rental property. And I want to sell it to you quit claim for a thousand dollars. The answer is, would you take that deal right now? Now, I know some of you are going to go, oh, I'll risk a thousand bucks. Let's say 10,000. Would you do it? The answer is you most certainly should not because you don't know my interest in the property. Maybe I'm lying to you. Maybe the mortgage is five months late. The HOA hadn't been paid. I haven't paid taxes in three years. And now all of that is yours because that was the interest I had in the property. You get that if I were to issue you a quit claim deed. So what is the purpose of a quit claim deed? The purpose is best used between parties that know the other party's interest, all right? Like spouses. And you will see a quit claim deed used a lot in divorce proceedings where one spouse quit claims their interest to the other spouse so that that person could own the house. All right. Now, doesn't get them off the mortgage. And we'll talk about that. The IOU doesn't get them off the payment. It just gets them off the ownership. All right. Business partners, family members, you know, those are people who know the interest. Why would a spouse take a quit claim from their spouse during a divorce proceeding? 
because they were probably together when they bought that property. So they know the spouse's uh, interest. It was a general warranty deed. You know, as a married couple, we bought the house while we were married. We went through the process. We got a general warranty deed. Now, when you quit claim to your spouse, they know that interest. So it is very good because it works quickly to take the interest of a from a party that you know their interest in it. You wouldn't take mine in that rental property because you don't know my interest. But business partners splitting up and one takes ownership of the actual physical real estate would be okay because they were together when they bought that as a partnership. So now they know their interest. And the words that they would use is remise, release, and quit claim. So you would know it's a quit claim. Now, quit claim also can do one other thing. It clears a cloud. A cloud is a defect or a possible defect that could be on the property. Let me give you a very simple example. Let's say I bought property and I took it in the name of Raymond Modulin. But when I sold it, I signed it as Raymond D. Modulin with a middle initial. Is there a chance that those two people could be different? The answer is yes, there is a chance because they have different names. One was Raymond Modulin. The other was Raymond D. Modulin. I could use a quit claim where I claimed quit or deeded the property from Raymond Modulin to Raymond D. Modulin. And now you can actually see a chain of ownership that it would be called a cloud. That's one way to do it. There's uh, many ways to clear this. <clears throat> um, happens particularly with females that maybe bought a property when they were single and in their maiden name and now have a different name or got divorced. Maybe they had their married name and now it's they've reverted back to a uh, their maiden name. So those could be potential clouds that could be used from a quit claim so that you could go back and see that chain of ownership. And we're going to get to that, but it's actually a chain of ownership. So all, one of those four are going to be inside of this granting clause. It's either going to say remise, release, and uh, alienate and uh, <clears throat> convey or quit claim so that the grantee knows what protections are coming with it. Another thing inside the deed is this thing called the habendum clause. The habendum clause is the statement that defines the ownership to have and to hold. This is the possession portion or the possession twig that is given, all right? So in the marriage vows, we actually have the words to have and to hold. It is the habendum clause inside of the marriage contract. So you can actually tell your spouse, I own you, all right? Because that is the clause that defines the ownership. 